This is Stephanie Huff and I'm recording a concept on cognition. This one is going to be on schizophrenia. Just an overview. Schizophrenia is the most common psychotic disorder of the brain. Its features are disorganized thinking, um, which makes clear thoughts and decisions difficult. Sensory and perceptual disturbances which complicates inner interpretation of the reality. Behavioral abnormalities can cause difficulty in social interactions. They also have affective disruptions and impaired social competency. They often have a more normal childhood with subtle signs starting to appear in puberty and severe signs and symptoms starting in late teens and early adolescent years. All right, so associated with psychosis is going to include delusions, which are false beliefs without basis in reality, hallucinations, which are sensory experiences of things that are not present, illusions are distorted perceptions of actual sights, sounds, or other stimuli, and paranoia are beliefs that others are basically just out to get them, Maybe that people are following them, whether they are or not, or people that are intending to harm them. Um, so basically, it's hard for them to know what's real and what's not in society. The DSM-5 does contain several disorders of the schizophrenia spectrum, and that's just because there are several disorders um, that have some schizophrenic type symptoms and processes and so um, they can have other things going on besides just being schizophrenic. Alright, looking at the pathophysiology, <clears throat> there are abnorm abnormalities in brain development. The primary problem uh, seems to be an abnormality in the development and migration of neurons in the brain. This results in a miscommunication between portions of the brain or it's also called faulty wiring. Neurons in the cerebral cortex seem to function incorrectly. Other developmental factors also are likely important. Um, and this is due to symptoms not occurring until late in the teen years. So they think that maybe there's some type of developmental factor um, that is related to this as well. They also have abnormalities in neurotransmitter levels and functions. The central nervous system irregularities are seen on brain imaging studies. Uh, the ventricles, particularly the sulci, are enlarged. Other areas show a decreased volume or activity in the brain. There are uh, defects seen in the corpus callosum, and this area um, affects communication between the hemispheres of the brain. They will have a reduction in blood flow to the thalamus. And this turns uh, sensory information into overload, so basically everything is just coming at them at one time, and it is very escalated. They will have decreased nicotinic receptors, so it's hard to form new memories. Um, and then many schizophrenics often unknowingly um, start to smoke and become smokers, and they think it's maybe to compensate for this deficiency. Looking at the etiology, the exact cause is not understood, um, but genetics seems to be a factor. Um, if parents or other people in the family have um, schizophrenia, then it is more likely um, that their offspring will have schizophrenia. It is diagnosed worldwide and affects about 1% of the population. The onset and progression will vary, very, will vary widely. Um, most <clears throat> adolescents have 
uh, some type of symptoms and some may not have any symptoms until they're in their 40s. So can kind of vary. Symptoms usually tend to decline with age, so the older they get, they will have decreased delusions and hallucinations. There is a greater risk for suicide in schizophrenics. Risk factors, your biological factors, um, like we've talked about, it, there's a genetic component. Um, prenatal care and birth complications may play a role. Um, advanced paternal age, so children with fathers that are in their 40s and 50s will have double or triple the risk of developing schizophrenia as compared to um, children that have fathers that are 25 years old or less. Social and environmental factors, um, communication defiance. This is communication patterns that are distracting and confusing to the listeners. Example, a child will ask the parent a question and the parent's response is completely off topic to the question that was being asked and so the child ends up being very confused. Your double bind theory is symptoms are partially an expression of contradictory family interactions is what they believe. Um, so essentially, there's a, they're in a no-win situation. So an example of this would be a parent that abuses their child, but then assures the child that they're loved. And so this puts the child in a double-bind situation because they're telling them they're loving them, but then they're abusing them, so they're getting conflicting information. Your bi-directional influence. These are um, individuals and their families can affect each other's um, emotion negatively. And so basically, they just kind of aggravate each other and affect each other's emotions negatively. And so there's nobody being positive in the um, relationship. Prevention. <clears throat> They're less likely to develop if not exposed to environmental stressors. Um, so some of the protective measures that they have found are reducing stress, so keeping them out of those high stress environments making sure that they get adequate sleep, they avoid illegal drug use. All of these can lower the likelihood of developing schizophrenia. There are also um, community-based programs and social support services um, available that can assist in uh, alleviating these stressors as well. Your clinical manifestations, these are broken into positive symptoms and negative symptoms. So your positive symptoms, these are um, contain the presence of additional psychotic behaviors, and these are things that are not commonly seen in your average adult. So hallucinations, um, they can be any of the senses, but auditory is the most common ones that you'll see. Um, after that, it's going to be visual. Delusions, these are also known as beliefs that have no bias in reality. And so these fixed and false beliefs will persist despite evidence to the contrary. So even though that they know it's not correct, they cannot get past that because that's what they are still believing is that this is really real even though they know it's not. They can't get past that. They can assume various themes as well. Um, this often causes them, these solutions and delusions, often causes them to lose touch with reality. Looking at other positive symptoms in thought disorders, they can have disorganized thinking, sensory overload, your disorganized thinking is that the individual has trouble logically connecting thoughts. This leads to a garbled way of thinking. The sensory overload is the brain's natural filtering mechanism um, becomes impaired 
This results in an abundance of sensory information that cannot correctly be processed. Thought blocking, uh, the individual stops speaking in mid-sentence as if the thought is disrupted in their head. Your neologisms, these are um, individual uses. Excuse me, the individual uses meaningless words that have no meaning. Loose association. Um, the individual will, will rapidly switch from one topic to another with no apparent connection between the topics. Clang is that the individual repeatedly uses rhyming words without any apparent meaning. Perservation is that the individual uses the same words or phrases over and over. So your positive symptoms for disorganized behavior. This is going to, um, which is basically disorganized behavior, is the inability to start or finish a goal-oriented um, activity. And so this interferes with the ability to lead a normal life. So the first one that we're going to um, talk about is, let me make sure I didn't go too far, is bizarre behavior. which is purposeless actions. Your um, overactive affect is basically just out of proportion. Inappropriate affect is basically just an incongruent one. They may also have poor impulse control. These are some of your manifestations of that disorganized behavior. Movement disorders will take on two forms. The first is an additional body movements which appear agitated repetitive, or even purposeless. Catatonia is um, basically being unresponsive to environmental um, stimuli or the environment or even other people. Alright, so negative symptoms. Alright, so the first one we'll talk about is anhedonia, which is um, individual is unable to feel pleasure and loses interest in life. This can result in decreased social interaction and withdrawal. Memory impairment is the individual couples incorrect recall of facts and events with a certainty that this recalled information is correct, leading to impaired decision making ability. Flat affect is the affected individual shows minimal facial expression and movement. They sometimes speak in a monotone voice. Lack of focus is individuals uh, displays a high distractibility and reduced concentration due to obstructive information processing and response mechanisms. Elagia, which is individual experiences impoverished thinking. This results in a nominal speech pattern, even during a focused interaction. Abolition is due to lack of motivation. The individual is progressively unable to function in daily life, at home, work, or in social interactions. All right, neglect of personal hygiene. Uh, individual will forget to bathe, change, or even wash their clothes, and so this further causes social isolation. And I'm sure it's because they smell so awful. Social withdrawal um, can be an issue. Poor problem solving. Uh, this involves impairments in the individual's cognitive skills. 
This leads to faulty reasoning, which affects everyday functioning and social relationships. Concrete thinking is the individual has a tendency to focus primarily on facts and details. This is coupled with an inability to think abstractly. Alright, looking at subtypes, specifiers, and dimensions. Um, in the past, schizophrenia was divided into subtypes, and that depended on symptoms and the pattern of onset. But with the introduction of DSM-5, they, um, the symptoms changed to better reflect uh, a wide variety of symptom types. Uh, they now use specifiers instead of, so basically before they would say schizophrenia of a catatonic type. And so now they would say schizophrenia with catatonia. Um, and so instead of just labeling everything as just different types of schizophrenia, they're actually um, using specifiers instead. Um, this involves a more dimensional approach. Uh, the rate core symptoms are rated on a 0 to 4 scale, and this is based on their past month's behavior. Some of your related disorders you have a schizoaffective disorder, which is a mixture of schizophrenia and a mood disorder. They will experience hallucinations, delusions, disorganized thoughts, and disorganized behaviors. They also suffer from at least one manic episode for a diagnosis of psychotic symptoms. Um, must persist for two weeks or more in absence of depression or mania. So basically they have to have psychotic symptoms for two weeks or more before they can be diagnosed with a schizoaffective disorder. And then it's based on all the other symptoms as well. In your brief psychotic disorder, these um, they usually have positive psychotic um, behavior symptoms, and those are the ones that we were just talking about. The episodes will last between one day and one month. Your schizophrenia phrenia form disorder, they have to have symptoms that last for one to six months. Um, for duration, but it used to be that they had to have it for six months, but now with the changes, they have to have these symptoms for one to six months. For schizophrenia, though, to be diagnosed, they do have to have the symptoms for six months or longer. All right, comorbid disorders. Um, at least 47% have problems with illicit drugs and alcohol. Smoking has also become more prevalent. Psychiatric disorders, um, they may have panic disorder, PTSD, your GAD, that's your generalized anxiety disorder. Mood disorders include depression and OCD. Medical illnesses include type 2 diabetes, um, which is twice, they develop twice as often as the general population. Lifespan and cultural considerations, the onset among men during the um, early to mid-20s. Um, however, women, the onset is during the mid-20s, so it's a little bit older. There is also known as an early onset schizophrenia, and it does affect about 4% of the sufferers of schizophrenia. It is equally found in males and females. They have greater childhood maladjustment, so a lot of times they show shyness, hesitancy, they may be withdrawn and have some cognitive dysfunction. Developmental delays are common. They have um, more hallucinations, um, but fewer delusions. Most of the children's hallucinations will involve toys, monsters, and animals. 
your early onset schizophrenia is a more um, has a more chronic course with worse symptoms. They usually have more hospitalizations. They have um, neurological developmental abnorm abnormalities. They have um, greater educational, occupational, and social development maladjustments. Collaboration. Um, there's a wide range of collaborative interventions related to schizophrenia that are available. Diagnostic test. There's not really a single test used for diagnosis of schizophrenia. It's usually based on the symptoms that are exhibited. Early diagnosis is very difficult and that's due to um, symptoms not being severe um, and vague at first. Um, and then also that there's a lot of other conditions that share the same symptoms that schizophrenia has. And that could be like bipolar disorder, depression, tumors um, in the brain, could be uh, medication reactions, or even the use of illicit drugs and alcohol. They do need a thorough psychological evaluation. Um, blood tests and imaging studies are also done, and that's usually to rule out any type of tumor or other cause of their symptoms. Pharmacologic therapy. Primary goal is to reduce the positive psychotic symptoms with the lowest possible dosage. There are conventional or typical antipsychotics. In the 1950s, they came up with chlorpromazide, which is Thorazine, and Haloperidol, which is Haldol, um, and they became the treatment of choice for positive symptoms. Side effects include hypotension, sudden cardiac death, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is characterized by fever and rigidity and increased prolactin levels, impotence. They can have extra pyramidal side effects. Your tardive dyskinesia is repetitive involuntary body movements. Um, they have varying uh, severities. Um, and a lot of times, even when they stop the medications, the symptoms do not go away. Your dystonia is unusual muscle spasms that are seen in the neck, jaw, trunk, or eyes. So it kind of makes them look like they have a little tick. Um, counteracting side effects, usually stopping the conventional antipsychotics um, will do the trick. They can administer anticholinergics, um, which help to raise the dopamine levels because a lot of times your antipsychotics will lower dopamine levels. Benzodiazepines may also help um, counteract these side effects. In 1989, um, atypical antipsychotics um, were developed to treat both positive and negative symptoms. And this is going to be clozapine, Risperidone, olanzapine, they do have a broader spectrum of action. The main benefits are that they have fewer extrapyramidal side effects. Um, they have improved mental functioning, uh, reduced depression, hostility, and suicidal risk. Your dopamine system Stabilizers is the newest class, and they are used to treat um, both positive and negative symptoms as well. And this is your Abilify. Side effects are nausea, vomiting, headache, dizziness, anxiety, restlessness, and insomnia. Um, adherence to medication regimen is a huge challenge. Um, a lot of these um, individuals will stop taking the medications because they stop working and a lot of times their bodies just become resistant to them so they don't work anymore. Um, others may stop taking it um, when they feel better 
and so they don't think they need it anymore. Others will stop taking it because they can't tolerate the side effects. So this results in relapses and worsening of their symptoms. Looking at non-pharmacologic therapy, psychiatric and psychosocial rehabilitation, they'll need to create opportunities to increase their skill levels um, so they can get back out in the working field, um, develop collaborative partnerships. Um, this is an ongoing process um, that they're going to have to kind of keep on and keep in touch with um, probably throughout their life. It's going to promote success in daily living. Clients can make decisions about their care and treatment. It also helps with job and social trainings and also it's important to teach them how to deal with their symptoms that they experience every day. Using the nurse as a resource is going to be important. Nurses are there because they um, can be sympathetic and empathetic. They are also good at ensuring that the client follows the treatment regimen. They can help teach skills regarding various vocational and social situations. And they can also help identify support in the community. Group therapy is an effective psychosocial treatment. Self-help groups um, can provide ongoing support and encouragement um, and it lets them know that basically they're not alone in this. They need to develop um, opportunities for social engagement. Family therapy and education is also um, important. Family um, therapy helps the family um, come up with ways to help the individual with schizophrenia and kind of helps them deal with them and know what is the best treatment and the way to deal with them and talk with them is. Your assertive community treatment, um, these are for those with um, that are disabled by their symptoms. They are assigned to a team that delivers individually tailored services. Um, so that they can meet the client's needs when and where um, is best for the client. This provides comprehensive and integrated community services. It is a proactive process that ultimately will decrease hospital times. Um, it decreases the severity of their symptoms. It helps to increase their quality of life and stability. Hospitalization may be needed. Um, this is often when the client is in their initial psychotic episode. And during this visit, they will do um, many multiple, uh, many physical and psychological tests. Medications are given to bring symptoms under control, um, and then usually once the symptoms are under control, the patient is discharged home. They may also be hospitalized um, in instances where they are a threat um, or have actually portrayed violence toward themselves or other people. Your electroconvulsive therapy is also known as ECT. This is a process by which electric currents are passed through the individual's brain to trigger a brief seizure and thereby reducing the symptoms of psychosis. This was originally introduced in 1938, but they had a lot of unsafe practices back then, and so it got a really bad name. Um, today, the treatment is a lot safer, and it's um, in a more controlled manner, um, and so they don't have as many um, complications as they did before. Um, it may take two to three months, though, for it to become effective. They use this electroconvulsive therapy to treat um, several um, disorders, including severe depression, depression with psychosis, if they have severe suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, or they have treatment-resistant symptoms of mania, which can also be the same symptoms that are seen in schizophrenia. 
The side effects of electroconvulsive therapy are headaches, confusion, and muscle spasms. Many of them also have problems with new memory formation for days, weeks, or even longer after this electroconvulsive therapy. But it is used in combination with medications, um, and it's used when your pharmacologic and your psychologic interventions were unsuccessful. So it's not like this is something they jump to firsthand. All right, so some of your other um, complementary and alternative therapy, the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation. This applies electromagnet stimulus to the scalp to affect brain activity in the cerebral cortex. And this is the area thought to be involved with auditory hallucinations. And so the goal is to help decrease those auditory healing, um, healing hallucinations. Your omega-3 fatty acids, um, they have been found in studies to produce positive effects with um, and with fewer side effects than your antipsychotics. And so they're thinking that omega-3 fatty acids don't have as many side effects as your antipsychotics and if they both can reduce um, the effects of psychosis and those symptoms then it would be better for them to treat them with these omega-3s. They've also done studies that found a significant decrease in the progression from when someone first starts thinking that they may have schizophrenia if they can get them to take omega-3s, then it can actually prevent them or decrease the progression to a full-blown psychotic disorder. Um, they have also had a reduction in both positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia, and they have had improvement in their cognitive functioning after taking omega-3s. Your aromatherapy, um, various plants are used they can be inhaled or applied directly to the skin, usually with some kind of um, oil or something mixed in with it. Aromatherapy has been shown to reduce stress, anxiety levels, and symptoms of dementia. It helps improve quality of life, cognitive, cognitive function, and independent daily living. Looking at the nursing process, Nursing goals are going to be to promote symptom control and facilitate effective coping. Coping is important to avoid further episodes of psychosis and to help improve the ability to function in the community. Looking at assessment of your client with schizophrenia does involve three elements. The first is the health history. You're looking at early behaviors that they're portraying. Um, you can do this by direct observation, interviews with family members, um, also making sure that you're looking at cultural influences. Um, other things are going to look at age, family history of schizophrenia, and other psychotic behaviors. If they've had alterations in their mood, any disturbances in their sleep pattern, drug and alcohol abuse, what their um, paternal age is, so like how old their father is. Um, there's a lot more um, things that are involved, but those are some of the main ones. Looking at the physical exam, this is the second element. You're going to look at their overall physical condition, look at their height and weight and vital signs. Looking for possible signs of malnutrition, uh, drug and alcohol use, poor self-care, um, depression, elevated anxiety, also looking at their medications and supplements that they're currently taking. The third element is the mental status assessment and there are several um, assessment tools that nurses can choose from to do this mental uh, status assessment. You do want to um, monitor for communication difficulties, um, if they're having delusions, any kind of movement disorders, any sensory or perceptual abnormalities, are they seeing things that aren't there, hearing things. 
um, synthesizing their assessment data is going to include their function in their daily life, what skills and talents they have, um, how stable their affect is, how well they can communicate, um, how do they get along with others, how can they function at work. So we've got a couple of slides that contain our NANDA diagnosis. <clears throat> All right, and that one's for the ones that experience psychosis. All right, so in planning, your broad goals may include um, reducing or eliminating the symptoms that they're experiencing, helping them to improve quality of life, enabling them um, recovery by helping the client attain their personal life goals, implementation, preventing injury, you want to administer antipsychotic medications as ordered. That prevents them from going into these manic phases and hurting themselves or other people. You want to ensure that their environment and their surroundings are kept safe and this will prevent them from engaging in violence to themselves or others. You want to minimize the environmental stimuli. If there's too much going on, it's very distracting and kind of can upset them and make their symptoms worse. Uh, use restraints if necessary um, and refer the client to hosp for hospitalization as needed. You want to make sure that you're removing potentially harmful objects from their surroundings too because um, you'd be surprised what people can find to use as a weapon. Providing symptomatic treatment. You want to promote control of current symptoms and minimize any new symptoms. You want to orient them to time, place, and person as needed. Help to remain calm and consistent um, when you're speaking with the patient. You want to avoid overwhelming or overstimulating them. Make sure you always tell them before you touch them. That can keep you um, safe as well as them. Um, educating the client and the significant others. You want to explore the current family communication and coping skills. You want to encourage uh, new effective coping strategies and encourage them to adopt healthier behaviors like um, stopping nicotine, alcohol, making sure they're getting adequate sleep, making sure they're eating a healthy, balanced diet, um, promoting social skills and occupational training, providing positive reinforcement to keep them on track, letting them know they're doing a great job. You want to demonstrate client advocacy. You want to ensure all interventions and therapies are in the client's best interest and not merely just to ease the burden on the family and the caregivers. You want to promote an understanding of legal rights and make sure the patient understands what their rights are. You want to encourage the client to develop advanced directives when their schizophrenia is under control and then that way once things go, um, if things get out of control and something happens then they've already got their advanced directives um, listed out because they're not going to be able to make any kind of um, informed decision at that time. Alright, evaluation and expected outcomes may include that the client maintains and follows their medication regimen. They are using the community resources that have been made available to them. They communicate clearly and they can transition logically between topics. The client will report absence of delusions and or hallucinations. They will be able to perform their activities of daily living. They will refrain from harmful substances and they will engage in those harmful substances, the ones we keep talking about like illicit drugs, alcohol, and nicotine. And then they will engage in paid work in a structured setting. So this is the end of schizophrenia. And as always, if you have questions, please um, let me know and I will try to help clarify things for you.